Okay, everybody, welcome. So uh, we're going to have a look at this session on flip learning. It's called One Step Forward, Two Steps Back. Uh, what I mean by this is during the pandemic, as I'm sure a lot of you have also been in this situation, I found myself in this um, real sort of period of disruption. So you, my usual focus is on kind of what I teach, finding sort of appropriate texts uh, for the student and subject matter, but suddenly the focus shifts to how to the mode of delivery. Uh, so I'd created a lot of um, lessons in lockdown that were kind of autonomous on Moodle. So we used Moodle, the university's um, virtual learning platform, and I'd spent a lot of hours creating these activities. And then suddenly we kind of come out of lockdown, the pandemic is gone, we return to the face-to-face -face world, and we're back in the kind of conventional classroom. And it kind of struck me that in the pandemic, it seemed as if we kind of blazed a trail, we'd gone down this sort of path into the future, into this brave new world of using technology. And I think I felt I'd kind of made real gains in this area, but there was a kind of nostalgia, a kind of like, um, it was kind of, we'd gone into the future, but then we kind of retracted massively, we'd sort of gone back. And I wondered whether this was a kind of nostalgia, whether we should or could retain some of the lessons that we made in the pandemic. Um, so coming out of the pandemic, I did what was called a PGA tell award, a postgraduate award in technology enhanced learning as part of my kind of ongoing professional development. So I decided to try and tweak some of the lessons I made in the pandemic and redeploy them in a face-to-face -face classroom. And I tried this with an arts and humanities EAP class. So we teach, I teach in foundation studies, uh, foundation students. We have um, content-based EAP courses for business, uh, science and engineering, social science and law. And I teach uh, on the arts and humanities pathway. It's a relatively new course. Uh, I created it in 2019, 2020. Uh, we started with about 15 students. It was looking really healthy. Uh, but then in the pandemic years, it sort of shrank to uh, eight. It was about seven or eight students for a couple of years. And in the last two, it's dwindled to four, four students. I'm hoping I can sort of help arts and humanities to survive. It's a really good course. Um, the students study textual, and art, textual analysis, they do uh, philosophy modules, history, uh, they do screen studies and literature, and uh, my job is to support them with that. Um, I use a core theme in my module, I use the First World War, and uh, we look at that through kind of ethical perspectives like Kantian ethics and just war theory, Aquinas, we look at gender. So the role of men and women in the war. They've just done a speaking assessment about whether women's status had increased as a result of the First World War. And we looked at that in the sense of kind of dominant and neglected narratives. So in the First World War, uh, because of, I suppose, the suffering of the fighting men, the troops, um, other narratives kind of can get disregarded. So we'd read a very interesting article um, about uh, women's roles in the war and... Uh, uh, a school teacher had been teaching um, her class uh, about the First World War. And after about six weeks, a student put their hand up, they raised their hand, and they said, but what about the women? What did the women do? And the, uh, the teacher realised that she'd sort of neglected that area. So it's quite a sort of ripe field. Um, it's such a sort of massive, encompassing experience that you can teach a lot uh, in that. But I wanted the content to be kind of comprehensible, going back to sort of like Krashen's theories, um, so the students are familiar with the subject, the topic, and hopefully that could um, enhance and um, sort of facilitate language learning. So um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the background uh, to my project about uh, during the pandemic, what's happened since the pandemic, uh, a bit about the theory uh, behind the project about flipped learning, why, why it's uh, potentially a good method. The, um, the article that I read is kind of theoretical. I'm not sure. There were a few um, articles I read um, that specifically relate to uh, EAP, ELT, and using flipped learning. But it seems uh, that it's still a bit sort of hypothetical. Maybe we need more, more studies to sort of back this up. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, because I only had four students, it's quite a limited sample that I was using. Uh, but the initial results sort of seem promising, but obviously you need uh, to conduct this with uh, larger cohorts to, so you can extrapolate uh, that, that data, the findings. Uh, I'll talk about the findings themselves and the results and the student feedback. Because it was such a small um, cohort, the four students, I used the kind of mi mixed methods. 
Uh, so I was using some quantitative data, I was comparing students' uh, entry scores um, before the intervention and also their exit scores. I think I compared the previous year when we just, well, we just had kind of autonomous learning online, but I um, then compared the previous year with the uh, year after I'd, uh, you know, after I'd start uh, use this intervention uh, in the class. And uh, finally, over to you, so I'll sort of briefly go through my project, and then I'm going to ask you which lessons uh, from the lockdown period that you would salvage, uh, but not just wholesale, would you make any tweaks or, or changes uh, now that we're back in the face-to-face -face classroom? So a little bit of background to the project. Uh, so during the pandemic, this was a real like a true disruption. Uh, so we put in kind of like emergency measures almost. So as I said, my usual focus was on the what, but it suddenly became about how, um, how we deliver. So it compelled these new approaches to teaching and learning. For me, I felt it was like a kind of experiment. I'm not the most tech savvy person in the world. Uh, so for me, it was uh, getting up and running with Moodle, which I hadn't used previously. Um, but um, at the time I was making this, um, we were kind of moving towards all of the modules on the IFP program, the foundation year, having a Moodle page. So I chose Moodle. There were other platforms I could have used, other technologies, but I wanted it to be accessible to the students and to have a kind of familiarity uh, because they have a Moodle page for the subject modules, uh, inquiring research skills, and also EAP. Uh, so this was kind of an, uh, a period of experimentation for me. So I developed uh, Moodle lessons in H5P format. Uh, can I just have a show of hands? Who's who used Moodle or is familiar with Moodle? That's great. Did you make activities like drag the words, mark the words, fill in the blanks, mm -hmm. those kind of things? So um, I used um, something, I can show you some uh, screenshots a bit later. I used something called H5P course presentations. It's very similar to PowerPoint in that it has slides and you can uh, scroll through the pages. Uh, so it's kind of a way of presenting language. If you were going to teach them some target language, some vocabulary, some academic phrases, you can present it as you could in PowerPoint. But this has the added benefit of being interactive. So students can do things, they can interact with each slide. Um, so we did um, sort of close activities, um, sort of reading uh, sort of gap texts and sort of deducing uh, where the words would fit. So I used it both for topic vocabulary and generic vocabulary. And we also did highlighting. Um, so we read uh, sample essays and there were highlighting features like identifying the thesis statement, uh, the aims, where the author's outlining, um, you know, the, the essay, that, that kind of thing. So it was used for vocabulary building and discourse analysis. So I felt there were some, some gains. Uh, this was during the pandemic. Uh, the online lessons were more learner-centred, less teacher-centric. Uh, I found that the online lessons, I'm not sure if this was the same for you, were more silent. But I would say that does not necessarily mean they were not productive. So we had sort of quiet times. I'd sort of log into Teams, the students would join. Sometimes they wouldn't have their cameras on. You'd just have these, like, uh, you know, their, their profiles, their icons. And there'd be sort of periods of silence. And I kind of did wonder sometimes whether they'd sort of gone off to make a cup of coffee uh, during my lesson or, or something else. They'd just wandered off or disappeared and they were just logging in. But actually, the engagement sh score showed otherwise. They were completing these activities. And some of them were pretty challenging with like, you know, 90%, 100% scores. So in this quiet time, they were working. They were building their academic vocabularies, which was very encouraging. But I did have lessons that were like the kind of uh, seance, you know, like, is anybody there? Anybody? <laughs> it was like trying to, you know, summon the spirits out of the ether of, uh, of teams. Um, so, yeah, the students were working autonomously, um, which is good in terms of motivation. Um, so we'll get onto that a little bit in the theory and also at their own pace. So th there's the idea that it can reduce uh, cognitive load. They could check their own answers. This was very efficient. So rather than checking all of the answers, one to 10 from that activity, they could just self-check. So maybe they only had one or two uh, difficult questions. And uh, we could focus in on those questions, the difficult ones, if all of the class had struggled. So it was, it was kind of efficient in that way. They could retry, construct their own learning. Um, so there was less teacher talking time. One of my colleagues, uh, Ian, who's the convener for EAP for Business, 
He's a martial arts fan. He's um, an Aikido expert, apparently. He spent time in Japan and he's, um, quite, he's a sort of like master of Aikido. And um, like me, he's a fan of Bruce Lee films. Do you, anybody like Enter the Dragon? Do you remember when Bruce Lee is going to Hans Island for the karate tournament? Uh, somebody on the boat, when they're going to this karate tournament, challenges Bruce Lee to like a fight on the boat. And Bruce Lee, uh, he says, what's your style? And Bruce Lee says, it's the art of fighting without fighting. And I don't want to spoil the film if you haven't seen it, but spoiler alert. Uh, Bruce Lee says, OK, we can fight, but not here. And uh, the challenger says, OK, if not here, where? And he says, there's a little island over there. We can take this boat. So there's like a lifeboat. So he lowers the lifeboat. This challenger gets into it. And then Bruce Lee sort of, it's, it's roped to the boat. He sort of lets out the rope and uh, he drags this poor man behind in the waves and the boat starts sinking and he's flailing. So that's kind of the art of fighting without fighting. But my uh, module convener talked about the art of teaching without teaching. He said there's too much teacher talking time and we can actually get in the way of learning. You know, why not just have the instructions uh, in the slides themselves and once students get used to the format, the might be some teething difficulties, um, we can save a lot of time. Um, so the idea was to um, put everything, the language building activities, instructions in the slides, let students get on with it, and um, then use class time, this was more coming out of the pandemic, for um, more productive activities. Um, so I tried, um, once we come out of lockdown, when we were back in the face-to-face -face world, I tried to utilise some of these lessons in class. I think students could see the utility, the value of the lessons, um, but they wanted uh, more discussion in class. Um, this was not, not the same across all disciplines. We tried this also in business. We uh, reused some of the pandemic lessons and business students were just happy to get on with it. And um, we have a staff student liaison committee where we ask them uh, for feedback. You know, do you enjoy these lessons? And they were happy in business, but the art students didn't want to do the vocabulary building in class. Um, they felt it took too much time. And I kind of agreed with them in that sense. We didn't always get on to the uh, pr more productive activities, sort of using the vocabulary you know, to speak, uh, to write. So we have quite limited time. Um, the, the Warwick hour is actually 50 minutes. So we have to finish 10 minutes early so the next people can come in and uh, set up. So you know, you're getting near 50 minutes and there's a, a group already outside the door kind of, you know, at your heels, so um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a bit like that. So they, they wanted to use, as I say, class time for uh, discussions, but obviously they've got to get the language input uh, from somewhere. Uh, I'm kind of of the mind that, um, you know, s the systems of language are sometimes like neglected. We focus on like writing, academic writing, speaking, but without, you know, the vocabulary, how do they have that kind of precision? How can they make their arguments persuasive, so they need the language from somewhere. So since the pandemic, it's a desire to return to business as usual. Um, recorded lessons and Moodle activities are already beginning to seem uh, anachronistic, but go, if you saw my plenary about Walter Benjamin, um, what, you know, we see them as anachronistic now, but when we were teaching them, that was kind of the future, um, recorded lectures. I'd, used recorded lectures myself um, so to build some of the content for EAP for Arts and Humanities I'm not a philosopher philosophy expert I struggled with uh, Plato's Republic when I was an undergraduate so I watched some of the recorded lectures of my colleague Amy who's a philosopher she went to like Oxford and I found this was really useful um, watching her half hour lectures I could pause write some notes I could review it if I hadn't quite understood it and I found that after about sort of three or, you know, two to three hours, I had a pretty good understanding of Kant's categorical imperatives, Aquinas' just war theory, things that were kind of new to me, and I could sort of uh, start using those uh, in my course from an EAP perspective. But yeah, they seem a bit kind of passe now, um, uh, as we rediscover the, the novelty of teaching face-to-face, -face, but it's not really a novelty, I would say, it's, you know, it's a kind of nostalgia in, in some respects. So are we in danger then of losing the gains that we made uh, during the pandemic? That's uh, the key thing. 
So should we discard our online lessons? So in consigning it to history, are we in danger of losing this spirit of experimentation? I really, I, despite all of the sort of tragic circumstances, I kind of felt quite um, infused in the pandemic, quite inspired. I felt it, something new was really happening uh, because it was just like a needs must. You had to sometimes put pedagogy aside and just um, with the equipment, the technology you had, make something, you know, for the lesson that you had at one o'clock that day. And um, I quite like working within those kind of parameters sometimes. Uh, you, you know, you don't have the luxury of being in a class, but sometimes working within those constraints can make you more creative. So that, that was my experience. And I felt a little less excited since we returned to face-to-face. -face. I kind of feel like I've gone back two steps. Um, so yeah, are we taking two steps backwards? And taking one step forward. So is it uh, possible that we can have the best of both worlds online and face to face and keep all of the sort of good content we've made uh, during the pandemic years? So I'm going to say rather than discard, uh, repurpose, that's my motto for today, uh, repurpose, don't discard. So um, I use Moodle for flip language learning. So I tried to salvage, as say, the best elements. Uh, Walter Benjamin talks about looking at the past, trying to find the kind of redemptive elements. Uh, he's like a, this kind of cultural archaeologist, and he's uh, sifting away, brushing away the dirt, trying to find the kind of hidden treasure, you know, like the gold of the past. So try to salvage that. So scour the ruins of the past, uh, the rubble, um, try and sort of recover the, the good elements. Um, so, in this intervention, technology was used to enhance classroom-based activities. I didn't use the technology in the face-to-face -face class, but I flipped it. So, I assigned this as uh, pre-class tasks for students. So, um, most of the kind of language input, the language transmission, um, I was, I was about to say more simple language transmission. I'm not sure if language transmission is, is simple, that's debatable, but... Uh, in terms of the Bloom's taxonomy, I wanted students in class time to be, um, you know, working with their topics, about analysing, evaluating, synthesising sources, and I felt that was better use of my time to sort of help them with that, rather than, you know, building like generic academic phrases. So I thought they could uh, do that more effectively, more efficiently uh, outside class. So assigned as pre-class tasks. So this allowed lesson time to be used almost exclusively. Uh, for output, for productive activities. So input was uh, before class, and we just used class for output. And I'd listen in, uh, I'd watch their presentations, listen to their discussions, we'd have some writing workshops, and I'd go around and monitor, and I would um, check how they were using the language that they'd been assigned um, in the pre-class tasks. So um, if you read Sams and Bergman, their articles on uh, flip learning, uh, they talk about the higher order skills, uh, like um, analysis, evaluation, con was it construction, constructing new knowledge, new disciplinary learning, and maybe that's what we should be monitoring uh, in the class rather than the, um, you know, presenting language and uh, practicing. Maybe some of that can be done uh, outside class. So theory behind flipped learning, I'm sure this may be elementary to you, you might have come across this before, use this. Uh, so Abba Zakera and Dawson. Uh, this was a kind of key article for me. This was about uh, motivation um, behind uh, that can occur as a result of flipped learning and also reduce cognitive load. So they have a definition. It's a set of pedagogical approaches that uh, one move, move most information transmission. Uh, so I'm saying that's language in my case, teaching out of the classroom. Uh, and use class time uh, for learning activities that are more active uh, and social and require students to complete uh, pre- or post-class activities to fully benefit. I mainly focused on the, the before, the pre-class uh, activities part. Okay, so that's the definition. Uh, how could it benefit students? This was... Um, a kind of, um, it, they, they pitch it in a kind of hypothetical way. They, they say like more studies are needed to sort of support this, to back this up, but they focus on uh, two key areas on motivation and cognitive load, reduction of cognitive load. 
So um, they analyse uh, the flipped classroom from two perspectives. One is SDT theory. I think I misspelled that S STD theory in my uh, PGA tell uh, coursework <laughs> and uh, cognitive load theory. Um, SDT, first of all, this is about motivation. It's uh, flipped learning seems to fulfill the three basic cognitive needs required to increase motivation. So these are all autonomy that students are constructing their learning independently, uh, independent of the teacher. So that's supposed to increase motivation. Um, it's more student-centered. Competence um, was a little bit ambiguous. It, it can mean competence as in like increasing your your skills level, but it can also be, I think, the perception of that. So they're not going to grow their vocabularies overnight, but if they've had a bit more time to work on it, to prepare for the productive activity, they've got maybe the perception, the illusion that they've got a kind of competence or they're moving towards mastery. So it doesn't mean that you've mastered it uh, overnight or in a couple of hours, uh, that area of language that they might be looking at. Um, so uh, it's also about a kind of confidence as well as competence. I would say confidence could be included in that definition. Uh, relatedness is about the social dimension, uh, relatedness, so that you're using the language within your um, class group, your seminar group, or also in the, in the sense of the wider academic community. So it's got some, uh, some social purpose. So autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Um, second, flip learning may reduce cognitive load uh, by changing the mode of delivery and allowing students to learn at their own pace. So as I mentioned, I viewed my colleagues' um, online recorded lectures and that, that was useful for me. I, you know, not knowing much about philosophy, I, I felt I'd got more and I, I, I kind of felt that feeling of competence that I'd started to make inroads into this difficult field of philosophy. Uh, by learning at my own pace, pressing pause, uh, replaying parts of the lecture. And um, I'm not the fastest uh, at handwriting. I think I've got some of my uh, former colleagues here. You, you know my handwriting is sort of dreadful. And it's only got a short shelf life. You know, it looks like, uh, I don't know, hieroglyphics, gyroglyphics. Even I can't understand it. So, you know, I could sort of take notes more carefully. And I had a quite clear and legible set of notes because I had more time to, to make the notes. So what does the project look like? So as I say, I used it for uh, vocabulary building and language input. Um, so I would say we need more time, need to give more time and attention to the systems of language. We focus a lot on skills and output and the finished product, you know, the student's final essay, their final presentation. Uh, but obviously you need the vocabulary, uh, grammar, pronunciation as well, sometimes neglected to support those skills. So it was about underpinning the skills of speaking and writing, and there's a, obviously a lot of evidence uh, for, for that. Uh, otherwise, I would say language teaching becomes a kind of alchemy. How can we expect students to speak well, to write well, unless they have the, the language? Um, so most students, when they come to us, um, the entry score for the foundation um, program is IELTS 5.5. Um, so um, in, in many cases, students have quite limited vocabularies, and with the type of subjects that they need to study, you know, they need to learn a, a lot of language or as much language as quickly as possible in a short time space. So, if you compared it um, um, speaking or writing to kind of like an omelet, you know, students could make a basic omelet. They had their eggs and milk, but they didn't have the finer ingredients. They didn't have like nice mushrooms or herbs or cheeses that they could put in their omelet omelette, maybe a bit of salmon, a bit of smoked salmon. Uh, so it's teaching them to, you know, giving them the, 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 the vocabulary uh, to make a, a, a better omelette, basically. So um, these are some screenshots of uh, the lessons I flipped. So uh, in our speaking assessments, we use uh, academic reading circles. We use um, ARCs. Um, in the arts and humanities, um, as I said, I used the First World War as a, as a core topic. And um, students um, read, read primary sources from history. They read um, letters, diaries, uh, manuscripts. But, but I also give them um, secondary texts, academic texts written by historians. And they have to synthesize those in a discussion. 
in the presentation, they present the primary sources they found. Um, so they do a five-minute presentation presenting primary historical sources. And then they have um, a group discussion, about 16 to 20 minutes. And um, that's based on common text. So I, I assign the text for the discussion so they have a kind of common ground, a shared understanding for discussion, a common basis. But they have kind of freedom of choice over which uh, primary sources they, uh, they look at. So for the presentation, I was um, teaching them a signposting language. So I didn't really do any of that in class. I flipped all of that. So I've got my kind of uh, you know, signposting words for the presentation, like, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to my presentation today. Very pleased to be here you know, this morning, that kind of thing. Uh, the topic of my talk is that they drag and drop the words. So I don't, don't think that was too, too taxing for them. And I think that it's better use of class time to work on the higher order skills and to flip those. So they kind of drag and drop uh, the words. Obviously, it gets a bit more complex than that as you get into the presentation. So they have um, giving like an overview. So I'm going to divide this talk into three parts. I'll start by looking at... Uh, next, I'll focus on, uh, finally, I'll consider. So they have to consider grammar when making their choices. Uh, so things like ing after preposition, I'll start by looking at that type of thing. So they learn language for giving their overview. Um, I would give them uh, sometimes a reminder, um, a, just a, a very brief review at the start of class using lexical primers. So I'd have maybe a five-minute uh, PowerPoint presentation where I'd um, just quickly review, we'd have a kind of memory test of the same phrases, but I'd um, gap some of the letters. So if it's uh, finally I'll consider, I would sort of maybe sort of gap it here and have a kind of like a blank. So I'll con or bo or fo. And then you'd have a kind of little jog to memory, a kind of phonetic jog, so we use lexical primers. I went to uh, a flip learning session earlier with um, Paula, which is really good, and. Uh, we had a kind of audience discussion uh, at the end. Um, uh, what one tutor said that actually it's, it's better not to have a review task because if students know they're going to get the review at the start of class, it can actually, uh, you know, they think, oh, maybe I don't need to do the flip task. Um, but I, I kind of was, uh, I could see from the analytics that some students did it, some students engaged, other students didn't. So. But I think maybe in retrospect, I think that's a good idea. I might withhold that review task, and I think that puts a bit more pressure on them. So obviously, they're not going to output as well if they haven't um, done the task. And maybe it's just you have to learn in a hard school. If you didn't do it, didn't do your homework, come to class, and you won't be fully prepared. And other students are going to you know, um, perform better, get the distinctions. So um, maybe that's something I could think about in future. Uh, we also did the same for discussions, like the seminar language. So um, in our class, we used, um, I tried to get them to use, uh, uh, to nominate other students when they were using phrases. So this was a mixed up words task, um, asking for opinions and inviting other students to speak. So I've got, uh, I think of it, you do what? The vet, what do you think? Or what do you think of it? Um, this was especially important in the pandemic when we had the speaking assessments online because obviously if you're in the face-to-face -face class you can just turn a vet, what do you think? But you don't have that luxury in teams so we tried to use more um, you know, nominated uh, uh, communication. Um, so you'd have things like that. Umbi, did you want to make a point? Would you like to add something G1? Uh, what are your views, Jambing? We do the same for similar things for clarification language, uh, checking understanding, checking uh, you've understood, checking others have understood you. Is that clear? All right so far. Um, agreeing. So I've sort of done sentence halves for that. I completely agree with you. That's an interesting point. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. That's exactly what I think. I was thinking the exact same thing. I feel the same way. Good point. Excellent point. I would say that's very important. Very valid point. Uh, I agree with you on that point. So we did uh, agreement phrases. And again, I'd have the primer to review this. Um, what else did I use? Yeah, so I used, sometimes I'd use mixed up, um, mixed up phrases, jumbled uh, words. Sometimes you'd, I'd use primers in class. Um, also disagreements, so polite disagreement or indirect disagreements. 
I'm afraid I disagree with you. I'm sorry, but I don't quite agree. I'm not sure about that. I don't see it that way. I understand what you're saying, but I see what you mean, but I'm not convinced. Uh, I agree with you up to a point. And um, that was something we focused on in class time, whether they were being critical of each other. I suppose the disagreement is more important that they were kind of, you know, arguing against each other, uh, counter-arguing to show criticality. So we could save a lot of time, they could learn that language outside class, and then I could see whether they were using it. I'd sometimes count up the incidences of like, disagreement uh, to check that they were being critical in their discussions. Uh, essay writing, you can use it for as well. We used it more for kind of discourse analysis. So they were writing about the First World War. We read um, a novel by Pat Barker, uh, Regeneration, which is um, it's a kind of a historical fiction novel. It's got some uh, real life figures like Siegfried Sassoon, the, uh, the poet who made this famous protest against the First World War. Uh, Dr. Rivers, who's a, an army psychologist. He's quite a progressive figure for the time. He's uh, um, sort of proposing like kind of Freudian talking therapies. So at the time, um, you know, many doctors used quite brutal methods like electric shock. If soldiers were suffering from shell shock, there was a doctor, Yelland, who would apply like electrodes to the patient, to their mouth, to their tongue. So he'd treat shock with shock. They've suffered shell shock in the trenches and he would treat shock with another shock to get them speaking so they can obey orders like, yes, sir, and they can re return to the front line. So they quite enjoyed uh, reading that novel. It was a, it's an interesting novel. So this is um, an introduction like a, uh, from a sample essay. So I wanted them to look at features like uh, stating the aims of the essay, uh, stating the scope, giving an outline, and stating the, the thesis or the main argument. Uh, this may vary across disciplines. Um, so I read a book by Richard McGrath Turley, who's a, um, a subject specialist. He teaches romantic poets at Aberystwyth, and he thinks uh, art essay should include these elements if it's your introduction. So we get students to um, click on the words and highlight these. The purpose of this essay is to analyse, that's the generic part, and you've got the topic specific part, Conflicts of Duty, and Pat Barker's novel Regeneration. Um, you've got the, uh, the scope of the essay, what it's focusing on, maybe the characters or the texts. It's focusing on these two texts, or it's focusing on these particular characters. It will focus on the two protagonists, uh, the soldier and war poet Sigrid Sassoon, who's made his famous protest, uh, Dr. Rivers, who's an army psychologist who treats Sassoon. And you've got your outline first, the duty of the soldier and doctor will be considered from two ethical perspectives, uh, Aquinas and Kant, Kantian ethics. Uh, then it will be used to analyse representations of duty and regeneration. And finally, the thesis, so you make your kind of transition into the main body of the essay. Uh, this essay will argue that while the causes of a war may be just and intentions good, uh, war inevitably leads to moral conflicts to, for all participants. Um, so they could um, analyse the various sections of the essay and learn those kind of key components uh, that they needed and then we could look at how they were assembling them in writing workshops in class. So I'd kind of give them anal analogous tasks, not with the same essay question uh, different essay question, but same, uh, same topic. Um, we could use it also for um, building kind of lexical sets. We could look at topics, more topic-specific language. So this was about duty. In times of war, the soldier has a duty to fight. Um, you can use it for um, uh, sort of footnotes, citations, and referencing. So as Nyberg points out, in the First World War, political objectives were not always aligned. I think it would be with, midi with uh, objectives on the battlefield. And then they've got their footnote reference here. So we use MHRA, which is a footnote referencing system for uh, arts and humanities. There are some limitations with Moodle. It doesn't always allow you to um, use decent formatting. So no Historia should be in italics. That's a journal name. But there, there are some limitations in Moodles. You have to put provisos, yeah, this is good, but remember in your essay, use italics for your, um, for your books and texts. Uh, and for reference this as well, so getting the names in the right order, like Aquinas, uh, Barker, um, Kant, uh, Miller, Nyberg, and so on. 
Um, so what did I find? I found there were some gains in, in speaking writing. <coughs> so I compared the entry and exit scores before and after the intervention. Uh, the greatest improvements were in speaking. They increased by 0.8 of an IELTS band score. So um, we, our criteria is kind of mapped to IELTS. Um, we've actually replaced IELTS on the foundation program. We used to have to teach students IELTS as a means to progression. Um, so that was their language requirement. But uh, EAP is now accepted by Warwick. And uh, Warwick's EAP is accepted by quite a good number of other universities as well. Not all. Sometimes they still need IELTS uh, as well. So it can be a bit of a hard sell. You know, you've got to do EAP in addition to your subjects. But it won't get you into all universities, but it will tick the uh, requirement for, for Warwick. So uh, we have this kind of back view to IELTS. We're equivalent to a CELT, uh, although obviously it's not quite this, you know, the same thing. Uh, so it was uh, almost a band score in speaking, and it was just over a band score in writing. I would say this is significant as split lessons were only used for these skills, or explicitly. Um, I did get them to read text outside class, but and to find their own text, but we kind of uh, really only explicitly use them for speaking and writing uh, in that module. Um, so uh, that's the entry versus exit scores for speaking and writing. <laughs> um, so they'd increased by about 0 0.3 for listening. They'd gone back a little bit in reading. That might be because the text, I suppose, are more lexically dense, uh, more challenging. Um, also, our sort of our speaking listening assessments are quite challenging. We um, we give them a, a short uh, lecture or an extract from a lecture, about ten minutes, um, and also a short text in the reading, about uh, a thousand words. And they have to write, they have to make notes. Um, in the reading listening, they take kind of linear notes. In the reading, they can make a concept map if they wish, um, and they also have to write a summary of the text of the key points and show the logical relationships in the text. So uh, I would say that our listening and reading, they're quite authentic. They summarize uh, a lecture, they summarize a text, uh, but it also is, I would say, slightly dependent on the skill of writing. To write a good summary of a lecture or a text, you need pretty decent writing skills. So um, the, the speaking and writing, for writing they have an essay, a coursework essay, so even though um, you know, you know, they might not have that great range of uh, language, vocabulary and grammar, they can, um, they've got time to work on it outside class. And also speaking, we let them know the topic in advance and they've got some preparation time for that. So I would say on the IFP at least, the reading and listening are more challenging. I would like to see those at the end of the course, the listening and reading. I think those are actually more complex. Um, for the writing and speaking, you know, we're kind of under pressure from the subject, academic subject tutors. They want us to get students up and running with speaking in seminars and writing essays quite early on. So it's not the logical order to do it. You know, we, we probably you'd learn language contextually first and then you'd output it, but it's a kind of needs must. But that, yeah, they did seem to have made gains in uh, those skills where, the, uh, where we'd flip the language uh, input. Um, so this sort of um, maps this or um, relates the Moodle completion scores to their improvement. Um, so this was the, uh, the speaking task that I showed you. Um, so I've anonymized the students. As I say, I only have four students. So they're students A, B, C, and D. Uh, those were their entry scores. They've got six, 6.5, 6, and 7. Um, so this was the total percentage for all of the flipped speaking lessons that they did. This student has uh, scored 92%, 87, and 95. And you can see their um, exit equivalent has increased. So that one's gone from 6 to 7 plus 1, 6.5 to 8, 1.5, 1.5 uh, uh, for student C. That student has actually gone backwards, even though they've completed the, the flipped uh, learning activities. But there could be also other reasons uh, for that as well, not just the language, but also like difficulty with the, the topic, can, you know, with the, with, the, with the disciplinary subject. Um, writing, I would just say just um, uh, with speaking, it, it could also be to do with timing. Uh, 
the flipped learning activities for speaking, I assigned those during a reading week in term two. So students didn't have so many kind of competing demands, like, uh, you know, with all of it, they do at least sort of like sort of 15, 16 hours of like classes a week. So uh, I think they had more time to do it. Um, the, uh, the engagement was, um, was not so great with the writing activities. That student doesn't seem to have completed anything. However, this could be because they clicked retry. I think they wanted to get 100% and they were kind of retrying the activity. So they may have cleared the Moodle data in that case. I think that's what they told me. I kind of interviewed them afterwards. Uh, this student has 37, 68. But you can see the student who completed it with a 90% score. They actually came in with the lowest entry level, 5.5, and they produced an essay, which was the equivalent of Band 8. It was a superb essay. So at least on the basis of one essay, they've increased by uh, two and a half uh, IELTS bands. But as I say, it's, with such a limited sample size, it's difficult to draw any uh, firm conclusions. So this is what the students said. They'd actually requested this. They didn't want to do the Moodle activities in class, but they found them useful. So they said, OK, we'll flip them. They agreed to this. Um, so afterwards, uh, this is what they said. They said, the flip Moodle activities are good. However, some tasks take a lot of time. Most activities could be completed in about 10 minutes, but it depends on the difficulty, on the level of difficulty. Uh, I tried to keep the tasks about something they could do in about 10 to 15 minutes, which is what Sams and Bergman say. They say you can't make it, you know, like two or three hours. Otherwise, you, they're just not going to engage. It's got to be manageable within the time that they have. So timing is important, not just the time allocated to the activity to complete it, but also when you set it, I think. Reading week was better than the writing. I flipped the writing in term when they had classes assessments to work on. So I think the writing, maybe my fault, my bad, that didn't work as well. Um, doing this kind of flip lesson outside the class is useful, I think, for time management. So that's a bit, that's kind of contradictory. This student said it takes a lot of time, but this student says it's useful for time management. So maybe they can use their optimum hours when they're less tired, when they've got less on. Um, if you're an early bird, do it in the morning do it in a time to suit you. So they, they kind of like the flexibility of it. Uh, I could go back and read the slides again, which is the same experience I had with philosophy. Uh, so maybe reduces cognitive load. Uh, more time for independent studying is great, which is a nice, uh, nice comment. Um, so these were my references. These are the key texts. I can share this with you afterwards, but <clears throat> That's the one about the sort of hypothetical basis about motivation and cognitive load, Abazakera and Dawson. I found that very interesting. That was the one about SDT theory and um, yeah, reducing cognitive loads, so increasing motivation through autonomy, uh, competence and relatedness, the social dimension, and also uh, reducing cognitive load. Um, you'll find numerous articles also by Sams and Bergman. What I got from that was to keep the flipped activity short, about 10 or 15 minutes, keep it manageable, and also think about when you set it, when you deploy it, when's the best time. So maybe look at students' assessment calendars and uh, make a judgment based on that. And also negotiate with students. This was a kind of negotiation um, with students based on what they'd said in the uh, staff student liaison committee. Um, so we have those at least once a term, and uh, we kind of uh, negotiated this with students. So they, they have a, we have module approval forms each year, and we always assign um, so many hours to private learning. So this would form part of their private learning hours. But if they're doing other things in private learning, you know, you've got to be careful you don't overload them. Um, so yeah, setting it, setting it outside the class might not make it easy. It might just add to their burden, possibly. So over to you now.